Good morning. I, um, it is my pleasure to uh, read with you from um, Daniel chapter 1 and um, to see how Daniel's training went in Babylon and also how they went with having their vegetables. Um, it can be pa uh, found on page 883 in the Church's Blue Bible if you would like to um, follow that with me. So um, let's go with Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, and along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the language of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name of Baltes Hajar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God has caused the official to show favor and symphony to, uh, sympathy to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink, and why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age. The king would then have my head because of you. And Daniel said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Thanks for that, Mari. Um, my name is Shady, if we haven't met before. Um, please keep your Bibles open in Daniel um, chapter 1. I'm going to pray and ask God to, uh, to help us uh, with his word. Let's do that together. Let's pray. 
Heavenly and gracious Father, we thank you that everything that was written in the past uh, was written to teach us, uh, so that through the endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, Lord God, we might have hope. And heavenly and gracious Father, we do thank you so much for your word. Lord, your word that is more precious than gold and so much sweeter than honey, honey from a comb. Lord, we we pray that this morning we might uh, see the preciousness of your word and we might be able to taste it. Uh, But Lord, all the more to taste you, to know that you are good, to know that you are the one who is calling the shots on this world and that this is your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, there's a, a taunt that seems to kind of pop up uh, every so often in movies or various writings where there's a villain uh, or an evil character and they have the upper hand on the main character. And the main character, uh, they're in a crisis, uh, there is no way out, and the villain wants to kind of crush the main character's hopes to be done with them once and for all. And so the taunt that comes out is, where is your hero now? We might have even heard that before in another way. Where is your God now? I wonder if you've ever asked that question of someone else before. Where is your God? Maybe not in a taunting way, but more maybe in an inquisitive way. Where is your God? Or maybe you have asked that question to God. Where are you, God? Where are you, God, when I am abandoned? Where are you, God, when I am far from home? Where are you, God, when I am in a strange place? Where are you, God, when the world around me is a mess? Where are you, God, when society is turning against you? Where are you, God, where, when we're on the outer? Where are you, God? Why aren't you doing anything, God? And maybe when there has been no answer, maybe you have wondered, is the Christian life even worth living? Well, those questions aren't new and they would have been very, very much uh, on the mind of God's people about 2,600 years ago where the story of Daniel is set. Where are you, God? Is the Christian life even worth living? And as we start uh, through the book of Daniel over the next few months, which is um, way more than uh, the lion's den, if you've read Daniel before, or way more than the fiery furnace, uh, we're going to come to face-to-face with some of those, uh, those questions. Where are you, God? What are you doing? Is the Christian life worth living? And the book of Daniel is going to give us some glorious, uh, wonderful answers in our series Uh, Shaky times, unshakable God. We're going to be reminded time and time again that this is God's world. He's calling the shots. And God's people, as we side with God, we're not going to be put to shame. As we enter into Daniel chapter 1 this morning, we're going to see that question, uh, have that question in the forefront of our thinking. God, where are you and what are you doing? And we're going to see in verses 1 to 2 of our reading today that God is doing a global work in verses 1 to 2. God is doing a personal work in verses 3 to 16. And God is doing a surpassing work in verses 17 to 21. Firstly, God is doing a global work. Uh, Though things don't seem like that, just look at uh, the first verse of our reading. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Here we have a massive crisis for God's people. The year is 605 BC, and the Babylonians, they're the superpower of the world. They are the ones who dominate the world. And the prophet Habakkuk uh, uses these words, which will come up on the screen for us in a moment, about their relentless power and assault on others. Ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Next slide. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry 
gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping to devour. They all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like the desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all the fortified cities by building earthen ramps. They capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their gods. These people are arrogant, prideful. They're ruthless, cruel, brutal, unmatched and mighty. And their leader was none other than the great King Nebuchadnezzar. And because I'm going to trip over his name throughout, I thought maybe let's go with King Nebi. Maybe it doesn't sound strong and mighty. Let's go with King Neb. All right, let's go with King Neb. Israel's king, King Neb, comes in and King Jehoiakim is delivered to King Neb. King Neb takes the articles from the Lord's temple and he carries them into the temple of his God and he puts the articles in the treasury in the house of his God. This is saying loud and clear, my God wins Israel. Where is your God now? Your God is worthless. Your God is puny. Your God's a loser. And all the action in the book of Daniel happens in the land of Babylon. And you might see a, a little um, A on the, on the word Babylon there in verse 2. And you look down at the bottom of your page uh, and you might see the word Shina. And Shina, that's another name of Babylon. But the word Shina is not often used that much in the Bible. But when it's used... Cast our mind back right at the start of the Bible. Remember, when we read the Bible, we want to read the overarching story from start to finish. And so, Shina, we go back right at the start of the Bible, Genesis 11. There, there's the Tower of Babel, mankind coming together, banding as one, one purpose, one society. The only problem, though, God's not in view. God's not there. And Daniel is actually trying to help us to see that. Shina, it's almost like back to that time, back to Sin City, if you like. This is mankind's greatest problem, running life without God. And by all accounts, it looks like God is defeated. The kingdom of man rising up, a king's God's kingdom. And it looks like God is defeated. And it looks like God's plans for the world which revolve around his people, it looks like it's in tatters. It's kind of hanging by a thread, and that thread is very, very thin. And the first verses scream at us, saying, Where is your God now? And I just want to, just a little bit of a tangent, isn't that the way that often history is recorded for us? There was once a mighty nation. They had the tools, they had the expertise, the strategy, the ammunition, the firepower. But then another nation came up and defeated them. They had the bigger fire, firepower, the better expertise. And they figured out the weak spot. They breached them. They overtook them. That's the way history is often recorded, isn't it? But not history according to the Bible. Because I wonder if you notice right in the middle, those four words sandwiched right in the middle of verse 2. And the Lord delivered. Or the Lord delivered gave the lord gave the lord's work on a global perspective why was judas king israel's king given over it was the lord's work the lord gave why were the temple articles taken out of the temple and put into the temple of the babylonians the lord delivered the lord promised actually that this would come about he sent his people warning after warning prophets who told the people to turn to god Turn to the Lord. Stop living self-centered lives. Stop living lives where God is absent. The Lord has warned his people that if they didn't respond, that he would kick them out of the land. He would raise a powerful nation that would exile them. Now the Lord is actually keeping his promise. Where is your God now? Well, actually the Lord was working on a global perspective, raising up a nation, delivering his people over, but his plans hadn't failed. See, it was the Lord who was moving the wheel of history to accomplish his good purposes. When everything seemed lost and hopeless, where dismay was the flavor of the day, we hear the phrase, the Lord delivered, the Lord gave. God was working out his plans on a global, 
world stage. He removes kings and he sets up kings. Where are you, God? God would say, I'm working globally. But he's not only working globally, he's working on a personal and an individual level. Look at verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. God is at work on a personal and an individual level. And this is actually in the face of assimilation of God's people. King Neb Neb, uh, starts a plan of assimilation of the young Hebrew boys. Get them while they are young and do that for three years. Educate their minds. Teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians, which involved all sorts of astrology and philosophy, all sorts of magic spells and omens, maths and science, all kind of mixed together. Enroll them in a prestigious university and make sure they get through And what do the young people need most when they're studying? What do they need? Food. That's right. Feed them. Feed them good. Give them the best portion of the food and wine that comes from the king's table. But that's not all. Set upon them new names. Impress upon them a new identity. They're not going to walk around with their old Jewish names that tell of the God of Israel. Daniel, whose name means judgment of God. Change it. Belshazzar, may God, Marduk, guard his life. Hananiah, the mercy of God, change it. By the command of Aku, the Babylonian god, that's Shadrach. Mishael, who is what God is? None of that. Said his name as Meshach. Who is like the god Aku? And Azariah, the help of God. No, no, no. We don't want that. Change it. Abendigo, servant of Nebo. See, the chief, the chief official goes around and sets these new names upon the Hebrew exiles to kind of wipe out their identity and give them a new one. Your God is finished. Where is your God now? But for Daniel and his friends, there is a line that will not be crossed. Where there enough is enough. Look at verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine and asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. And there's a little bit of a play on words in the original. See, the chief um, official sets new names on the Hebrew exiles, but Daniel sets it upon his heart. Daniel resolves in his heart that he's not going to defile himself. See, Daniel was willing to undertake the education of the Babylonians, to have his name changed, but not to have the food and the wine. And the question that you might be thinking is, well, why? Why the food and the wine? Why was the line drawn there? And I want to say, actually, well, the text doesn't actually give us a clear reason. It could be because of the ceremonial uncleanness that came from eating unclean animals. God had said, for example, in the book of Leviticus, there were some animals that you shouldn't eat. That was what it meant to be uh, living in God's, uh, as God's people. But this doesn't actually explain the wine. Some think that eating and drinking with the king was kind of like saying, look, I pledge my loyalty uh, wholeheartedly to the king. It's not all clear. But what is clear is that Daniel thinks that there is actually a real danger here to be completely sucked in and lose all his distinctive God-glorifying identity. So he draws a line. Daniel and his friends, they don't fear the education that was set upon them. They undertook it. They worked hard at understanding and coming to grips with the Babylonian mindset. They didn't withdraw into a, a little kind of hatch. They allowed their names to be changed. But there was a line that wasn't going to be crossed. And things actually are quite on a knife's edge here. Because Daniel's not setting himself up against just the chief official. He's actually setting himself up King Neb, the mighty King Neb. Death is on hand. Death is punishment. And you kind of uh, pause and wonder for a moment here. Because you wonder, well, if Daniel and his friends didn't say no here, that enough is enough, would they have been able later on in the book to say no to some other things. We actually find out later in the book that Daniel and his, uh, 
the three friends, uh, they get tempted to worship an idol, but they say no, and they get thrown into the fiery furnace. Would Daniel have later on said no, not when he was 30 or 40, but when he was actually in his 80s? Would he have said yes to praying to God and no to defying the king's orders? If he didn't say, if they didn't compromise here. You wonder. See, Daniel and his friends resolve to say enough is enough. And what happens when you defy the king? What's God going to do? Well, we don't know. Or do we? Because what happens? Again, what is God doing? Just look at verse 9. Now God had caused the official to show favour and sympathy to Daniel. It's actually the same word again. Now God gave. We hear in verse 2, God gave Jehoiakim over. God gave the official favour and sympathy to Daniel. There is God's work on a personal level. See, the official hears what Daniel is saying. He's afraid because if he rejects the king's menu, all the, the, the uh, Daniel and his three friends' um, health will suffer. But then actually also the official's head would be lopped off. But God's hand is still present. The friends eat their veggies and the water. For 10 days, they look healthier and better nourished than all the other friends that ate the royal food. And I, I don't know if Ben said it in the kids' talk, but I just do want to say it here. This isn't a proof text for being vegetarian, just in case you're wondering. This is all about God's work that is personal and individual in someone's life. Where is God? Where are you, God? Well, here we see God is actually working personally. And God's work, finally, is actually a surpassing work. His work is matchless. Look at our final section in verse 17. To these four young men, God gave, there it is again, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And at the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief presented them to King Neb. And the king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. Again, the concept that keeps coming up and time and time again, these are unmatched. These men are unmatched. These men are in a league of their own. They've got wisdom that kind of overflows, knowledge that's incomparable. And in their final exam with King Neb, they pass with flying colors and they come into the king's service. Was it, again, was it because they studied so much? Maybe. No, again, we hear that the source is God. God gave. And he gives, uh, amazingly, making sure that his people are unmatched. And what a remarkable turn of events. You know, remember, because right at the start of the chapter, we find exiles, nobodies, from a destroyed kingdom. But now they are the cream of the crop, serving at the king's palace. At the start of our passage, we read, there's the defeat of Jerusalem and God's people. And at the end, we meet the victory of God's people in a foreign land, having understanding and knowledge ten times better than anyone else. And as we actually continue throughout our book of Daniel in these series, we're going to see how the Lord will use these four to display his unshakable kingdom, an enduring kingdom, to the Babylonians. And actually, the very last verse of our reading, verse 21, hints at this. Just look at verse 21 with me again. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. This isn't kind of like a remark about Daniel's life, like a, kind of like a fairy tale where he lived a happy and long life ever after. This is actually saying God's servant, Daniel, outlives the strong and the mighty Babylonian kingdom. Again, what a change of, uh, from the start of our reading. Mighty Ma Babylon, remember? That army that kind of marches in, cavalry galloping headlong, their hordes advancing like the desert wind, gather gathering prisoners like sand, a symbol of might and strength and power, and yet this kingdom actually falls. It's like we have like a, a spoiler alert to the rest of Daniel. Because later on, actually, in Daniel, we find out Cyrus, the Persian king, comes in, crushes Babylon, 
Daniel will be there. Daniel lives to see Babylon fall. The Lord's servant would surpass the Babylonian kingdom as he trusted in the Lord, as he resolved not to defile himself in a foreign land. He was a a faithful servant who would actually conquer through holding fast to the Lord. Where is God? He's doing a surpassing work. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. See, and as we flick over into the New Testament, we see the faithful one, the one who resolved to continually live life God's way, resolutely set his heart upon God's way, the one who would be handed over to the powers of this world, given over, the one who would overcome as he willingly laid down his life. And by all appearances, it looked like defeat. By all appearances, God's king crucified on a cross, God's king hanging there naked on a Roman cross. Where is, this, where is your God now? But there was God working. This is how Acts 22, chapter 22, puts it this way. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, signs, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. This is how God shows his rule and invites us actually to live under his rule, a kingdom that would last forever, a kingdom that doesn't look like it right now, but a kingdom that will surpass and supersede all others because God is actually behind it doing his surpassing work. See, as we continue through our series in the book of Daniel, we're going to be comforted and challenged time and time again to see that God is at work because this is his world. He's the ruler. He calls the shots over this world. We're going to be reminded of God's global work. And isn't it amazingly comforting because how often we're hearing nations rising and coming to power. We often hear the breakout of wars just on the horizon, big events that unfold on the world stage. But Daniel chapter 1 actually tells us God's in control of that. He's working out his purposes. And it's God's work in each of our individual lives. His rule extends even into the mundane of our lives, if you like. Small matters in our lives. You know, he's the God who's the very hairs of our heads. He numbers, he knows them. This actually came to me a little bit more in the forefront of, uh, of my thinking, I think as a kind of a, a little bit of a wake-up call over the last Easter. Four of our six family members were uh, struck down with gastro. Now, down with gastro over Easter, and I'm kind of thinking, God, isn't this, this is the most uh, wonderful time to get together as your, your people to celebrate what you've done for us in Jesus? Couldn't gastro have waited? Maybe could have come the week before. Oh, that's church camp. Maybe it could have, maybe this week. I don't know. Couldn't have waited a bit more. And the thing was, this is actually our second Easter uh, here in Warnable, And it's the second Easter where we've been struck down with sickness. The previous Easter, we were close COVID contacts, so we couldn't come. Maybe it's an Easter thing. Maybe you could pray for us that we'd, all of us, all six of us would be here next Easter. It hit me hard, but God again is at work, even at this personal life, even the things that seem so mundane to us, God is at work in our personal lives. God gives and his work will surpass. We're going to see that throughout the visions of Daniel. Uh, Maybe um, you were thinking maybe we're going to stop at Daniel 6. If you've read Daniel before, Daniel 7 to 12 gets a little bit, well, a lot of visions, a lot of dreams, a lot of things. You go, wow, this is a lot here. But we're actually going to be reminded of the way that God's reign will extend into the future And it'll be an encouragement for us to side with God. And because God is at work, this is his world, because he's never defeated and he never will be, see, we can then resolve not to defile ourselves. We can resolve to live that holy life. This is actually the backbone to our resolution to be loyal to the Lord. See, Daniel and his friends, they never compromised. They never lived the hermit crab kind of life. 
They engaged with their world. They learnt all about the Babylonian literature with all even the magic omens. They even walked around with new names. But there was a line. God graciously, so Daniel graciously and thoughtfully resolved that line would not be crossed. He and his friends did that together. They made their stands. And so actually the question for us this morning, brothers and sisters, is where will you make your stand? Where will you say, this is where I will nail my colours to the mast? Is it at the work or the sporting club where you, maybe you won't join in with all the gossip or the slander that goes on? Or will you resolve to set your heart upon God's good purposes and good design, even as we heard before, for sexuality and gender, and not giving in to sinful ideologies of this world? Will you not be squeezed into Babylon's mold and make money and success your goal? See, will you take your stand as you teach your little ones that living for Jesus, living that godly life, is more important than grades and accolades, and that living for Jesus is very, very costly, but very, very worth it? And will you take your stand as we encourage one another to live God's way? At what point do you need to take your stand? When was the last time you took your stand? Two questions for us as we uh, head out into uh, morning tea. At what point do you need to take a stand? And when was the last time you made a stand? Where is, where is our God? He's at work in his world. So we resolve to live for him. Let's pray together. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that by your word you brought all things into existence. This is your good world that you have made. And thank you that you are the one who is ruling. You're the one who's calling the shots, even though things sometimes just don't seem like that, God. But we thank you. We thank you as we are reminded again through Daniel 1 that you are the one who gives, you are the one who calls the shots over this world because it's yours. And so help us to take confidence in that and help us, we pray, to resolve to live for you as foreigners and exiles just passing through on our route to heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our final... Um,